take them down and take them down and take them down down take them take them down take them down and take them down and take them down down as you look the whole room explode and slow down and wait the You guys having a good time so far? Oh, you guys are really excited, I can tell. Excellent. All right. Um, so, as he said, my name is Kenneth Wrights, and I am. Uh, this is API driven development, which is uh, basically a short rundown of how I like to build things. And I think a lot of people um, could benefit from thinking this way. So, um, give you some context. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want. Uh, I'm at Kenneth Wrights, and I'm also getting very close to 5,000 followers. So, if you guys help me out there, it'd be awesome. Um, I work for Heroku, which is a really great platform for deploying web applications. Um, and if you want to talk to me at all, come talk to me at any time. I'll be happy to, to talk about that if you want. Um, we're also hiring, so and we have people all over the world. So if we have a jobs page if you are interested. Um, so if you know who I am, it's probably from the open source that I've built. Um, I have built uh, requests, which is HTTP for humans, which uh, basically sending HTTP requests in Python is really difficult um, by default. Out of the box, it's like extremely hard. Like people who do Ruby a lot think that like uh, net HTTP is really bad, but it's so beautiful compared to what Python has to do. It's amazing. Uh, so if in um, in Python here, I built requests, and it's it's pretty awesome because it makes it super easy to do really powerful things. Um, and that's kind of what all of my things that I try to build uh, revolve around is this user experience as a developer. Um, so I wrote this other thing called HTTP bin, which let uh, people from all communities use. And it's basically a little HTTP mirror. Um, so like I built, so when I was building the unit tests for requests, I had to like, you know, when you send a request, like different clients send different things. You have like accept headers and, uh, you know, the connection um, header and user agents and all that stuff. So it it's basically gives you all these little tests that you can use to see how your client reacts. Like you can say, I want a 404, or I want a 301 redirect, and it'll give you nice things for that, and it just returns JSON. Um, did a bunch of other cool things. Uh, OSX GCC installer, a lot of Ruby people use, and that uh, basically allows you to use GCC on your Mac without having to install Xcode, which uh, I got Apple to call me on the phone with, over that one. It was pretty, pretty interesting, but anyway. Um, you know, this is a really diverse group of people, right? Like, we come from all these different backgrounds. So you have, like, we have developers, we have product guys, um, we have, like, non-technical co-founders, so you have sales guys, who are kind of like the hustlers of the group, um, designers, which are, like, the pixel pushers, and then you, uh, marketers, which essentially spam everybody, and you have the developers, which kind of, like, sit in the corner, and they're the code monkeys, and they just kind of make things work, and no one understands them. But like, I think all of us kind of have a lot of, really have a lot in common. Um, basically, we're all makers. We all try to craft different experiences and interfaces. So product guys are like really, they try to be visionaries and they try to like craft the world around them. And uh, designers try to e e develop experience in the users of their software. And uh, developers make all the magic happen. So I don't think we're all that much different. But I'm only going to focus on developers today, and developers, 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 because developers are awesome, and they're who really get the things done. Um, so there's this really great quote by Steve Jobs that I found recently. There was like this three-hour interview from like the early 80s that was released, um, and this really cool clip that came out of it. Um, basically, so Apple was like really brand new. They, people were just starting to figure out what they were about, um, and the quote goes like this. Uh, people are going to be basically spending two or three hours a day with these machines, the Macintosh, which is uh, more time, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's more time than they spend with their car. So software design must be given at least as much consideration as we give automobiles today, if not a whole lot more. And I think that that really uh, shows why Apple is so successful in what they do. They put all that thought and engineering into the software and into the hardware that they build and the ecosystem that they foster. And it, obviously, it's paid off really well for them. And uh, we spend way more than two, two hours a day on our computers today, you know. So, and automobiles have so much energy and, uh, and design consideration and teams and money thrown at them that computer software should be way more important. And, uh, yeah, it worked really well. So, you have, like, 
all the industrial design of the Apple devices. You have all these great clients and like, like these really rich native clients and the web is doing all this really cool stuff. Uh, and it's like really important. It really worked and it resonated with people. So let's say your end, average user is gonna spend four or five days with software, right? I think the developer building tools with your, you know, let's say the APIs that you build, um, they're going to be spending like eight hours a day, sometimes 10, 12 hours a day working with your APIs. So those shouldn't really be treated any differently. They should be just as important, if not even more important, than the user-facing stuff. So if you look at your basic web application here, um, kind of the generic stack of how people build things, usually, um, say you're using something like Rails or Django, it's kind of like this big MVC framework types thing, uh, you have three different components to your application. You have uh, tools and utilities, which is like you know adding new users and things like that. And you have your web process, which kind of does the bulk of the work. It's like what people are talking to. It's what powers the API. It's what talks to the database. And then if you have some things going on in the background, you have like some kind of worker queue process thing that's running and does all this stuff. Um, so let's pretend this is all in one giant code base in this big like MVC framework that everyone loves to use. Um, what happens is. I usually make this this big funny thing, but we're short on time today, so I'll just kind of skip through it. Basically, what happens is when you have a really large code base that interacts with all these things at the same time, it's really easy to tightly couple all the different components of your stack. And you know, you start having like API services that are talking directly to the deferred task system, which is talking directly to the supporting services, which is talking to the CRUD admin, and all these things are tightly coupled. And if you try to change one little part, you know, things break, and it just gets really crazy and there's all this technical debt that builds up and it's not fun at all. So a different way to look at this is as, it's called um, distributed services basically. It's, uh, um, so let's say you have developers and you have end users. These are the two types of users that your application is gonna be comprised of. So instead of just building one giant application that kind of does everything at the same time and it's this big mess, uh, a much better and more elegant approach is to just build separate services that can uh, be composable, basically. So you have uh, end users, which are basically talking to the HTML website that's being presented to them. You have your developers, which are, they want to consume like a, a JSON API or something like that to build something. Like Ideally, they could just use the API service to build the front end site. So you can start building these services that talk to each other, uh, and then Basically, when you're like building the front end for the users, you don't have to worry about the database. You don't have to worry about all these different little nuances in the application. That's the API's job to know about these things. And you have a really nice abstraction, and that allows people to build much better software and focus on their areas of expertise. And you can build more things. And all right, so to do this, uh, I think the really best way to approach software in general, this, this way was kind of like web stuff. This applies to everything, not just web. Um, but the first thing you do is you have an issue. You actually have a problem that you experience uh, first firsthand. Um, I really think you can't solve a problem well unless you've experienced it yourself. Um, ideally, I mean, obviously you can solve problems if. But um, I'll skip over this. So GitHub, for example, is like this tremendously successful company, right? There's like over two, I think it just updated to three recently. So three million people are collaborating on GitHub. And like, you know, the people who built GitHub originally, they were not trying to like build this great tool uh, for all the developers in the world. Uh, you know, they were like working on this like shitty um, family website where you could share all these file, uh, files and pictures with your family members and no one really wanted it. And they built GitHub just like for all the tools that they were building for themselves. And all their friends were like trying to use it. And uh, you know, they were asking them if they could pay for it, and then they suddenly like realized that this is you know they were building this thing for themselves, and that is what really resonated with people because there are people just like them who have the same problem as them, um, and it resonated with millions of people, and it worked out really well. Um, Gumroad does the same thing. Thirty Seven Signals uh, they built basically like you know they were they do a bunch of consultancy stuff, so they built like Basecamp to manage all their projects for themselves, and they just let other people use it, and it was tremendously successful. Uh, same thing with Ruby on Rails. They were doing all these Rails apps, and they wanted to, or Ruby apps, and they wanted to build something that streamlined the whole thing. And it wasn't, they weren't trying to like own the market share. They weren't trying to engineer something. They were trying to build something that they wanted to use. Um, so I think this is really a very pragmatic way of looking at the world, basically. Um, pragmatic means dealing with things 
sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. So I wrote this request library. Um, and basically, what, the way I built it was I just kind of like tried to figure out how I wanted this library to be before I wrote anything. Um, and then I had this real problem that I solved for myself. And I didn't even think anyone was going to use it. Like I was trying really hard to build other things that I thought people would care about. And this thing was just the thing I was building for myself. But it got like immensely popular um, really quickly. And it was great. And people started getting on board. And it kind of sucked at first. But you know, as more people were interested, uh, a lot of features kind of grew over time. The API was never compromised. So the way I, to do this is to respond to that problem that you have, step two. And the way I do this is I write the readme before I write any of the code. So I sat down and I looked at the problem at hand, which is I wanted to make these get, you know, if I had this thing that was written, it was perfect, I'm just going to write some code with it as if it's already written. So you write some little example code for the, like you would have in the readme, like the marketing page for this thing, like why you should use it. And uh, that really allows you to interact with the problem directly. Um, so you know, once you do that, it's like this giant achievement unlocked, right? Instead of engineering something just to get the job done, you start interacting with uh, the problem itself, and you build an interfa interface that reacts to it. And you're actually like discovering the problem, and you're responding to it. So like great sculptures uh, typically aren't like engineered or manufactured. Someone doesn't go out and they're like, I'm going to build this exact thing with this exact piece of you know of uh, marble. Uh, the sculptor will like you know go and he'll try to find he'll study and he'll listen to the marble and then he'll respond to the marble and try to you know create something that was inside all along. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with code. In responsive design, when you're working on like a website that's supposed to work on all these different devices, it's not about like it working on all the different devices. It's about making something that identifies enough with itself that it can respond to the environment that it's placed in. Like it has this fundamental understanding of how it's supposed to present itself. So if you just throw it in any random you know, parameters, it will function well. And it kind of frees it of arbitrary constraints. So readme-driven development is really responsive API design. It allows you to build something that is reacting to the environment it's being placed in, instead of just like wrapping an API around some problems that you've been trying to solve. Um, so then when you actually go to build it, um, Basically, you just write all the code necessary to make the, those little function calls that you made in the readme happen exactly as they're, as they're put in there. And let's say like that one function call actually has like a thousand lines of code underneath it. Uh, you can write a layered API, so you have like lower level things and higher level things. So if you look at like uh, Git, for example, when you install it, you know, you, there's only like you know, maybe eight commands that you use on a daily basis. And those are called the, uh, the porcelain commands, basically. These are the really high level things. And what they're doing is they're actually calling like 20 of these really low-level things that are inside. So if you like do git tab in your, com in your terminal, you're going to see like 100 some commands that are all these really low-level things that no one ever uses on a daily basis. And uh, so you can do that in your code. You can write a bunch of functions or a bunch of classes that like no one ever sees. But if they ever want to dip down and do the more complicated things, then it's you know, very nicely organized, the same way as those distributed web services were. Um, so yeah, um, I think that the API is all that matters, and everything else is secondary. And I'll take the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do to you, and it's build tools for others that you want to be built for you. Um, some pro tips as you're doing this. Uh, the one thing that I found a lot that helps is uh, I find that I do a lot of other things besides software development. Uh, I, do, I like to mess around with synthesizers a lot, and I do photography. And I find that um, if I'm working with something in a creative fashion, and code is a very creative art form, um, basically having a constraint really allows me to be better at what I'm doing. So with photography, for example, I use a prime lens that doesn't zoom in or out. It just is a fixed focal length. So if you want to take a picture and be closer to something, you have to like move with your feet. And it allows you to be significantly better at composing, and it, it, it's, a, it's a better tool for the job. And I find this with a lot of things, like... Uh, for note taking, I don't like to use like a bunch of crazy apps. I just like use a pen and paper because, you know, it's that nice constraint of like just writing down the notes. You can focus on the task at hand instead of being distracted by all these knobs and and options. Um, another cool thing is I like to pretend that I'm going to open source everything, even it's an, even if it's in an internal tool. Um, you know, so it's like I'm building something for my company or just for myself, and it's private. I'm, I pretend that it's an open source project. 
Um, and that really allows things to become concise and decoupled. So that giant thing that we had before where everything was talking directly to each other, if we were building um, components separately that were open source, that wouldn't be happening. Um, and you have all these really, really good best practices. So if you were building, let's say, like you know, a website that's going to be open source, you're not going to like stick all your database credentials in the repository, which is something a lot of companies do. So if you pretended it was open source all along, that wouldn't have happened. Um, documentation and tests become crucial. No, no open source project is worth its salt at all if you, it doesn't have great documentation. And the same goes for your internal code. And uh, another benefit is that if you ever do want to release the code, uh, you can. So you don't have to go and try to figure things out. Um, so I'll leave with this quote, which I really like, by uh, Peter Hinchins. And he is the founder of the company behind uh, ZeroMQ. And it is that uh, simplicity is always better than functionality. Basically, you know, if you're going for this API and this readme-driven development or API-driven development uh, way of building something, then it's always better to have something that works really well for 90% of people than to have something that works really well for 100% of people and then it's really hard to use. So simplicity is always better than functionality. And uh, that's everything. So does anybody have any questions? Excellent. You guys are great. Thank you very much.